So I'm going to say that again. Um, so thanks everybody for being here. My name is Morgan. I'm the North Central Field Representative for Montana Wildlife Federation. Um, and we saw that there was a need, just women really being interested in rules and regulations and licensing, and it can be super complex. So we are joined tonight by Laura, and I meant to ask you, Laura, I don't want to get your last name incorrect. Is it Hajek? Hajek? No, it's Hajek. Okay, <laughs> so Laura, um, Laura and Katie, and Laura is a administrative assistant for Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. She is based in Great Falls. She's been with the department for over 13 years and is known statewide as a friendly, positive, and supportive problem solver. Passionate about helping others, especially educating kids about wildlife, getting more women outdoors, and helping everyone navigate the hunting license and permitting process. She's a mother of two, an avid hunter and angler, and last year she successfully completed a hunt of a lifetime and got her first Montana mountain goat, which is very, very cool. Um, congrats, Laura, that's awesome. And then Katie Vivian is a fisheries biologist for Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks uh, based in Shoto. She is a force for advocating for women in the sporting space. And um, Katie and I have worked together a couple of times. She supported MWF and Artemis Sportswomen um, as a volunteer instructor at the Women's Ice Fishing Clinic. And she personally hosted the butchering workshop that we put on. So we try to do women specific events like this when we see that there's a gap and that we need to fill a need. Um, and so Katie has been super supportive of that. And she, brought Laura in, which we're pretty stoked about. Um, and so Katie's passionate about sharing her skills and equally passionate about her family's farm, her family, and her pups. So yeah, welcome everybody. And thank you, Katie and Laura. And I'm going to make you both the host so that we can get rolling with your presentation. And if, um, just so everybody knows, if you have questions, please hold them until the end. Um, we'll go through the presentation and hopefully there'll be time to ask. So, thank you. Awesome, okay. So I'm gonna get this going. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to do a brief overview of the fishing regulations. And it's just gonna hit quick um, and try to clarify a little bit of it and then leave as much time as possible for Laura to talk about the hunting uh, regulations and permitting process because it's a big topic that we wanna leave a lot of time for and then have time for questions. So starting with fishing regulations, uh, let's get to move forward. There we go. So our fishing regulations come out annually. Uh, so right now the 2023 fishing regs are already out. Uh, we will have uh, 2024 regulations and then we're actually moving and I believe in 2025 to buy annual regulations where they'll be for two years. Um, and you'll just get one, one uh, packet, one book for two years. Um, but right now we're sticking with the annual regs and it's really important to get them every year and updated because we do change our fishing regulations in response to different management practices, just like our, our hunting regulations. And so when I moved to Montana, I found the fishing regs to be very complicated. Um, so I'm hoping that talking through them a little bit will make them a little easier for people to navigate if you're not familiar with them. But essentially there are three fishing districts in the state. There's the Western district, the central district and the Eastern district. And that's how the regulations are organized is by these three big districts. So the first thing is to figure out what district you're in. And to kind of point that out, um, when looking at the general rules, they're broken down by those districts. So this is um, just the general fishing season rules. So for example, for rivers and streams, if you're in the central district, they are open uh, year round, unless there are exceptions, which we'll talk about the exceptions. And then uh, lakes and reservoirs are open year round as well. This is compared to like the Western district. So if you're fishing over on the other side of the continental divide, uh, most rivers and streams are actually closed 
after November 30, 30th to pro protect spawning habitat um, unless otherwise stated. So first and foremost, you got to figure out what district you're going to be fishing in. And then that will make the rest of these regulations a little more clear because you can just stick in that section of the book. Additionally, what I wanted to point out was for residents for fishing licenses, um, it's in there as well. It breaks it all down by if whether you're a resident or non-resident, but essentially it's uh, $8 for a conservation license, $2 for the AIS pass, and that's regardless of whether you buy it for two days or for the whole season. And so if you want to um, pay for two days, it's $5 for two days of fishing plus those additional fees, or you can pay $21 for the whole season. So the total cost is $15 for two days of fishing or $31 for a whole year of fishing. And that is for residents 18 and older um, or 18 to 61. Uh, it changes whether you're non-resident or if you're a kid or if you're over the age of one. But um, basically, the takeaway is if you're fishing more than four days, just go ahead and buy your annual license. It makes it a lot simpler and then you don't have to worry about it. Or you can buy a sportsman's package, which we'll talk about later. Going forward, there we go. So as I mentioned, the book is broken down into those three districts, the Western, the Central, and the Eastern. And um, each district has standard regulations. So at the front of this, the chapter, so the start of the Western Division uh, District chapter, it's gonna put out the basic daily and possession harvest limits for different species. So for example, if you're in the Western District and you wanna, you're going fishing, on some lake and you want to uh, target burbot, uh, if you're in the Western District, you can keep two daily and in two in possession. That's harvest. So that's just for harvest. That's not catch and release. Um, and so that means for that lake that you're fishing, you can catch and keep two um, and you can then have two in your possession. But if you wanted to go back the following day, you needed to eat those that night. So you don't have them still in your possession to go back the next day to keep fishing. Now this is different. Um, these, these are the standard regulations for that district. So, so the central district is gonna have slightly different harvest limits than the Western district. So for example, if you're fishing the central district, like say you're gonna go to Holter and you wanna also target burbot, it's actually uh, five daily and in possession. So again, you just wanna figure out what district you're in and then you can start looking at what those um, standard regulations are for harvest limits for daily and in possession. So that applies to all water bodies in that district. That's like a, a flat covering for all water bodies. Now, a lot of water bodies also have exemptions. And so the next step is say you are deciding to go to Georgetown Lake, you've looked up what the, the district regulations are. What you're gonna go do next is you're gonna flip through the book and see if it is listed as an exemption. So you're gonna flip through it, and if Georgetown is in there, it's going to have some exemptions to those, those overarching rules. And so you need to know what those exemptions are. So for example, for the central district, let's flip back really quick. For the central district, um, for Kokanee, it's 10 daily and, and in possession. So that'd be the overarching rule for central district. But um, for Georgetown Lake, it actually has an exemption where there is no possession limit and there is no daily harvest limit. So that's the exemption for that water body. So you can go there and you can keep as many as you want. So it's your job to kind of figure out what district you're in, then look to see if that water body has any exemptions or exceptions, and, and then just kind of know that moving forward. I, I do keep a set of regs um, in my fishing bag because there's no way that you're gonna memorize all of this unless you're going to the same spots every time. Um, this will include like seasonal closures, for spawning tributaries. It'll include um, ice fishing rules, regular um, summer fishing rules, things like that. So there, it's all in here. There's a lot of information packed in here. Um, but if you ever have like any questions about like, is you're just not sure about it, call a regional office or call the biologist for the area because we're always happy to kind of help clarify what's going on. But just as an example, reservoirs in my area, so like Willow Creek, you can only fish two lines through the lake. That's the overarching standard regs is two lines per person. But just 
Adjacent to it, just up the front a little bit on Pishkin, you can actually have six lines per person. So if you didn't um, check that as an exemption, you wouldn't fish as many uh, lines as you would get to. So, so that's all I had for fishing. Um, but if anyone had any questions, I'm happy to answer them really quick, or we can answer them all at the end. But that's kind of like the quick um, overview on fishing rigs. Good. All right. Go ahead, Laura. I'll, all right. I'll move um, it for you. So we are going to move on to the hunting portion, which is Katie to described earlier. The fishing regulations are kind of confusing and the hunting regulations, if you're brand new, can be extra confusing as well. Um, so this first slide, it's just a little screenshot kind of of our website, which um, our website sometimes is hard to navigate and find exactly what you're looking for, but there is tons of information on that. Um, we're going to move on to just some, uh, just some basics on the hunting licenses and then a little vocabulary. So our next slide here, um, here in Montana, we have both hunter ed requirements and bow hunter education requirements. So we have a state law that says if you were born after January 1st of 1985 that you are required to take a hunter education class. So that can be a class. Um, that you took here in Montana, or we accept any other state's hunter education class as well. So anyone born after 1985 is required to take that by state law. And that's something when you're buying hunting licenses for the first time, you will be required to show that and enter that into our system. If you're an archery hunter, we have a law on that as well that says you're required to either have the archery education class or you can provide that from another state as well. Or in addition to that, you can show proof that you've archery hunted in another state. So all states are a little different. So we'll kind of talk about what our licenses look like and how that works. But if you did archery hunt in a previous state and you need to show that you can bring the license into our office, um, we do accept emails from other state agencies and that sort of thing. Do you have anything to add on the hunter ed, Katie, since you are one of our instructors? I don't. I am um, I would def the only thing I would say is um if you are looking to get certified uh with hunter education in Montana, I highly recommend taking the in-person class um, if you haven't done much gun handling. Um, our in-person classes go over gun handling and gun safety a little bit more than the online version. Um, but they're both good options. Perfect. Okay, so we can move on to our next slide. So this is kind of um, where it does start get a little tricky for people. Um, so we're just going to talk about some of the vocabulary people will use when they're talking about hunting. Um, you'll hear a lot of times like licenses and permits and be licensed. And sometimes it gets a little confusing, especially if you're new to this. So um, a license is what you need to actually harvest an animal. So by harvest, I mean if you're going to go out and, and look to shoot a deer. If you're going to shoot a deer, you need a license to do that. Okay. Um, so we have in all of our species, we have a general license. Um, and then we also have what's called a bee license. And so in this state, a bee license is for an antlerless animal. And here in Montana, antlerless is less than four inches. So sometimes you'll find deer with like little teeny horns or they're um, a yearling. So their horns haven't, their antlers haven't grown. Well, that's still considered antlerless if it's less than four inches. Okay, so we have our general licenses and then we have a bee license. So we have a bee license for a deer. So that would be for a doe. We have a bee license for elk. So for a cow or calf elk, there's bee licenses as well for antelope. Then in addition to the licenses, we have what's called the permit. Um, that's kind of the, if you've heard anyone talk lately, that's kind of the hustle and bustle right now. We'll talk about some of the deadlines, but that's one of our major deadlines that we have right now. And it's an April 1st deadline and it's for a special permit. So in some areas you can apply for a special permit. So, 
remember we have to have the license in our hand to be able to harvest an animal. A permit is like the best way to describe it. It's a permission slip to go to a certain area and do something special. So we'll look at a couple examples with the regulations, but in some areas with your general elk license, you could only shoot a cow elk, so an antlerless elk. But then if you have, in addition to that, if you put in for the drawing and you draw this special permit, that permit might allow you to harvest a bull elk. Okay, so they're kind of two different things. So if you're actually wanting to harvest an animal, you're gonna need the license. The license is what you're gonna attach to an animal or notch out, which we'll talk about kind of the process and how you do that. The permit is just like a special permission slip to do some, something special in that area is the best way to describe that. Okay, so general deer and elk licenses. So we're very lucky if you're a Montana resident, you can buy these licenses anytime. Um, Katie did mention earlier our fishing licenses. So our license year in Montana starts on March 1st. So if you're wanting a new fishing license, this is a great time to start buying it because it's good from March 1st through the end of February. So right now, if you buy your general deer license, that will be good for the upcoming deer season. So Montana residents can purchase these general licenses anytime um, for you know 18 and over up to 62 years of age. A deer license is $16 and then the general elk is $20. Um, that doesn't include any of your prerequisites, but I mean, it's a great deal. Non-residents on the other hand though, they cannot just go over the counter to a Walmart or a licensed provider like at our office and buy a general deer and elk license. They actually have to get drawn for that. And that's actually a pretty competitive process these licenses, the general deer and general elk, they are good statewide. However, there's restrictions in the specific hunting districts. And we'll talk a little bit about how the states broke up into these districts. So, you know, a lot of people that are new to hunting, it does get confusing, you know, putting in for permits and general license. If you don't know for sure, a general license is a great way to start. All right, we'll uh, move on to permits here as well. So permits, remember that it's like a permission slip to do something special in a certain area. These are all an application process and these have that, um, that April 1st deadline. So permits are hunting district specific. So we'll talk about how the states broke up, but each hunting district may have a certain permit for that numbered area. The permits can also be assigned to a certain weapon. So by weapon, I mean there's some permits that are only good for archery season. So that's for all the bow hunters out there. Then we have additional permits that would be good for archery and rifle season, as well as our traditional muzzle loader season as well. Then there's also permits that are species specific. So this comes into a play a lot with deer. So we have permits that you might need in a special area for a mule deer buck and a different permit you would need to harvest a white tail buck. In a lot of these areas, especially for deer, um, you know, if you don't know for sure, we'll talk about a general license is a good place to start because when you put in for these permits, they can have certain restrictions on you. And this was a major change in our regulation last year when it comes to elk. So you can have your general elk license. That's what you need to harvest the, the animal. Then in addition to that, you have a permit for a special area. If you draw a permit for an elk, you can only harvest an antler elk in that specific hunting district. So it will limit you a little bit as to where you're hunting. We have the deer permit. So you have your deer license, you have your permit to go and shoot a deer in a special area. That's kind of always been the case with deer. If you put in for one of these areas that had a, a special permit to be able to harvest a mule deer buck, that's the only district in the state that you can hunt mule deer bucks. You could hunt a white tail wherever you want, but those antlered mule deer is only in that district. So I definitely recommend, you know, just from my personal experience, 
if you're going to put in for one of these special permits and you want to have a chance at drawing it, you do a little research and you kind of know what you're getting into because it can um, limit you a little bit. And that was a major change last year. And I think a lot of the hunters are just learning that because the regulations, just like fishing, they can change from year to year. So it's really good to kind of look at those and touch base on that. All right, so the regulations, um, they're available through our website in electronic version or printed version. Um, like I said, these can change every year. They do go online typically before we get them in the office, but usually our offices have them, all the regional offices, and then a lot of the sporting goods stores will carry these too. Um, as far as when we're hunting, I feel like we have 20 copies of the deer and elk regulations. I mean, I have one in my hunting pack, we have one in the glove box, and I think we have one in probably almost every room of our house too. So these are a great resource to have. Um, you know, a lot of times you're going to look at them and think, oh, I'm not going to read every page of it. But there are times when it's like, oh, I'm so glad I have these regulations just to reference. All right, we'll go on to the next slide. So in the regulations, there is, we're going to go over this a little bit, but there is in like so-called instructions on how to use these. Um, I have to say when uh, people come into the office, I, I could point them to these instructions and say, just read this, but it is very easy if someone just sits down with you. But basically for all of these, our regulations are, are split up. Um, the deer, elk, and antelope, all of those three species are in one regulation book. The confusing part sometimes for folks is, we'll talk about how the state's divided into hunting districts, but the deer and elk districts are the same. Uh, antelope districts are a little different from the deer and elk districts. So just because you're hunting in one area for a certain species, you definitely want to double check to make sure that that's going to be the same area you're going to want to apply for for a different species. Um, this will kind of tell you, you know, like what, how, how to read these, um, what, what weapon you're going to use, what type of license is required, that sort of thing. Let's see here on the next slide. Um, so in the beginning of the book, there's the district maps. Um, so how our state is broken down is we are divided for uh, hunting, hunting specific. Um, we are divided into seven regions. And then within each region has individual hunting districts. So right now, um, Katie and I, we both work out of region four. So region four is huge. We're in North Central Montana. So we go from the Canadian border down to White Sulphur Springs. And then our Western boundary is the Rocky Mountain Front. And then we go all the way over to Lewistown. So it's a tremendous amount of land that we have there. Um, so in the front, there's hunting districts. So anything that starts with a four, so that, Example I have circled is Hunting District 447. That's a popular area. It's the Highwood Mountains. So we would know that that is managed by Region 4 because it starts with a 4. So if you ever had a question about that, the best thing to do is probably to contact that regional office on that. So first thing to do is figure out what general area you're going to look at. Okay, So you'll do that by looking at the map. And then the next slide here, it is, it is um, each specific hunting district has a page for their regulations. So remember, we said we were going to look at hunting district 447. So you flip through and they go in a numerical order and you'll see that it's described at the very top. It's hunting district 447 and they name that square butte. Um, then right below that, it's going to have deer. So it's going to list everything you can do and apply for for deer license. Right below that, it has elk. So every single district will have those two broken up like that. So in the regulations, it is a lot to read, but it's not like you need to read every single hunting district in the whole state. What I typically do is if I know that I'm going to go to hunting district 447, before I go out to that area, I check to see what I could actually harvest in that area and what I can do. And then I also kind of check the surrounding 
areas too because you know if you're driving out there and you run upon some deer but you're in a different district it's good to know what you can do in that specific area so if we go on to the next slide it's kind of a zoomed in version of what that 447 area is so remember we have our general licenses for a resident you can buy that anytime over the counter so the price doesn't change and there's no deadline. So you could buy it right now, they're on sale. You could buy it the last day of the hunting season and the price is not gonna go up. So you'll notice if we were hunting deer in that specific area, I have it kind of broken up a little bit. Um, so highlighted in yellow, we'll see where it says general deer license. It'll show us in that specific hunting district, we could shoot an antlered buck mule deer or either sex white tail. So each license you have is valid for one animal. So just because I'm in 447 doesn't mean I can harvest both an antlered buck mule deer and an either sex white tail, it's one deer. And then those dates listed next to that, you'll see that the first column is for the archery season, the second column is for the general rifle season, and the third column is for that traditional muzzleloader. So that general deer license is good all three seasons in that specific district. In that very last column will be any restrictions or additional information. So let's move on to elk with a general license in that specific district. You'll notice where it says general elk license. And then right next to it, it says antlerless elk. So remember that's gonna be anything less than four inches. So you'll see the dates where it's good for. You'll notice something kind of different on one of those columns, though it does say that it starts August 15th, so it has a column that, and then it has an additional column at the very end from November 27th through February 15th. In Montana here, we have certain districts that have what we call is um, a shoulder season or an early and late elk season. These are areas where um, there typically tends to be a lot of animals on private land. Um, for people that are new to hunting, sometimes these animals will kind of congregate on private land, especially in the winter. They can, or you know, early on before the season starts, they can damage crops, they can become a nuisance. So this is a tool that the department gave to landowners so that they can say, if I'm having elk problems and I'm in this specific district, I could actually get a hunter out there in August or after the general rifle season to help take care of some of these problems. And you'll notice that that does have a little restriction on the end. It says not valid on forest service. So you'll see that, oh, sorry, the dog just opened the door. <laughs> you'll see that um, it's not valid on forest service. So that means that license is gonna, you're mainly gonna be hunting on private land um, BLM, which is the Bureau of Land Management, or DNRC, State School Trust Land. So below the general licenses, list any other opportunities you might have in that specific district. So we have the drawings, which I kind of talked about. Some of those have that June, a June 1st deadline, and some of them in this area have a April 1st deadline as well. If we look at deer, there's a few opportunities for additional deer besides your general deer license in that area. So we have that deer B license at 44700. That would be for an antlerless mule deer in that area. So you'll notice they only, get, I kind of cut out, off the column it looks like, but it has a June, the June 1st deadline. And then it has how many licenses we gave out last year. So remember, that's an antlerless mule deer license. So remember, that means you can actually harvest a deer with that license if you're drawn for it. So you could have your general license, and if you're drawn for that, you could still harvest a mule, an antlerless mule deer. So you have two licenses, so you could kill two deer. Right below that is a deer B license, and that's highlighted in green. It's an over-the-counter license. So that's one that a lot of hunters will purchase. <coughs> It, it says antlerless whitetail over the counter August 7th. That's something that you can buy starting August 7th. You can buy it the last day of the season because you'll notice in that next column, it's unlimited. That very last column says uh, one per hunter and it's valid in all region four hunting districts except 455. 
So it is valid in any hunting district that starts with a four except 455. So just think we could have our general deer license in that area. We could get drawn for a mule deer doe, and then there's an over-the-counter deer license as well. Right below that, there was another drawing one as well. Um, it's another whitetail good in all region four hunting districts. So it kind of gives hunters the opportunity to decide like, okay, if I know that I'm gonna hunt in this area, maybe you know a landowner or you have a place that you're familiar with that you're gonna hunt. That lets you kind of be species specific because these animals do live in, in typically different areas, you know. Um, Whitetail are gonna be more on the river bottoms, cricks, that kind of thing. Mule deer are a lot in coolies and sometimes more in the mountains, but you can catch them both anywhere. So this is just another opportunity for you to harvest additional deer. Below the elk, this is kind of where we're getting um, busy with our licensing season. You'll notice the elk permit. That has an April 1st deadline. And there's two elk permits highlighted in purple. There's a 447-20 and a 447-21. Um, this is how I was talking earlier, how they have some different uh, permits for different weapons. That very top one, that 447-20, that you'll notice that says either sex elk. Either sex, we get this question a lot in the office. So can I shoot a, a cow elk? Sure you can, it's either sex. Well, can I shoot a, a big bull? Yep, it's either sex. Well, what about a spike? Yes, either sex means any elk that you see that you have uh, public legal public access to. So either sex elk, you'll notice if you go over a couple columns, that one is good during the archery, the rifle, and that muzzle loader season. Okay, so that is one, if you only hunt with a gun, that's the permit you would need to apply for. However, look in that last column. <coughs> that's where it's gonna, have those restrictions that I was telling you about. And that was that change from last year. Basically it says, if you put in for that special permit and you draw that, that's the only hunting district you can hunt a bull elk in during any of those seasons. Cause that permit is good during archery, rifle and muzzleloader. So during those three seasons, that's the only place you could hunt an antlered elk. You could shoot, still shoot a, a antlerless elk depending on what you could do in a different district. The elk permit below that, that hasn't, you'll notice that number instead of dash 20, it has 21. They give out a few more of those, but you'll notice it only has one season date listed, that September date. That's an archery only permit. So that means if you have that, that's going to limit you during archery season for bull elk in that area. Okay. Then right below elk, we have um, an over-the-counter elk license. That's one member over-the-counter you can buy anytime starting that August 7th through the end of the season. The price won't change. Um, just like the general elk license, that's $20. But you'll notice that does have some restrictions on it in that very last call. So it's not good on forest service, not good on our wildlife management areas or the CMR um, wildlife refuge. Also, it's not good in hunting district 410 or 455. So that's basically another tool for landowners that say, oh, you're having elk problems. Well, if someone has this elk license, they can help harvest an elk on private BLM or DNRC. That's the main um, areas that someone would be looking at for that area. So it is, it is kind of overwhelming for folks just starting out because there are all these different licenses. But just remember your general license, you can buy any time. The general licenses are good statewide. You just have to check each hunting district as to what you can harvest. Then you just have all those additional drawing opportunities and over-the-counter licenses. All right, we'll move on to the next slide. So these are some of our important dates and deadlines. Um, and these are for uh, residents. So we have the April 1st deadline, that's for your special deer and elk permits. In addition to that, non-residents do have to apply for the general licenses, um, those general deer and general elk licenses. So they also have that April 1st deadline. We are able to hunt um, moose, 
sheep, goat, and bison in this state as well. So there is another regulation just for those species. That one has a May 1st deadline. That, those regulations aren't as overwhelming. Basically, you pick your, your district you're gonna put in for, and they draw, you know, the one to maybe 15 per species on that. So these are what those regulations look like. Um, those don't have as many opportunities but it is, it's a great thing if you think you wanna put in for those. We also have a June 1st deadline. So remember when we were looking at those regulations, we have elk and deer bee licenses that you can apply for. And we didn't touch much on it, but antelope is pretty similar. So antelope is broken out into hunting districts. So it's not like your general deer and elk license that you can take anywhere throughout the state. Antelope is hunting district specific. <coughs> For antelope, we have a general antelope license that would allow you to kill a buck antelope or a doe. And then we have antelope B. Remember, B licenses are antlerless. All of those are hunting district specific and do have a June 1st deadline. So after all of these deadlines and drawings take place, sometimes there's extra and leftover licenses. This happens a lot with uh, certain deer hunting districts and then a few elk districts as well, mainly for those bee licenses, so for those antler licenses. So after the drawing's done, we have a surplus list sign up. Um, you can sign up on that list. They give everyone a number. Then after the deadline closes to sign on up, sign up on it, they randomize your number. And then if there's, let's say there's 500 licenses available for deer in a certain area. They typically give people the opportunity to purchase two of those. So they would email the first 250 people and say, do you want to purchase that license or not? And you have about five days. Then they keep going down the list. And then eventually those licenses go on sale over the counter. Then on August 7th, we looked at that kind of in the regulations, but there's just over the counter licenses that you can just buy. Um, those ones typically don't have a cutoff date, prices don't change, nothing like that. All right. Um, so there's two different ways that we you can uh, have your licenses. Um, so you can have your regular paper licenses. Um, to do those, we just print them on a normal normal printer paper and away you go. You have to, a lot of times too, people will put them in baggies to keep them safe out in the field. Um, you can laminate them, put packing tape up on both sides just to keep them safe from the elements. But a new thing that we have too is our MyFWP app. And this is a way that people can have to uh, have their licenses and permits electronically. So you would create a username. And then when you go and purchase your licenses, it's actually all on your phone. So there is a way that you would have your non-carcass pigs. So a non-carcass tag is something that you actually don't do anything with when you harvest an animal. So like fishing, it's just a fishing license. You don't actually like have to do anything when you catch a fish with it or your bird licenses. Those are non-carcass tags. But your carcass tags will show up on the app as well if you choose so. So that would be like your deer license or your general elk license. So the app is pretty handy. You have your licenses on the app. You download them before you go in the field. And so they're on your phone through the app. And then when you harvest an animal, there's actually a button on the app that says validate harvest. You have to click on it, you know, two or three times to confirm your harvest. Um, and it timestamps when you did that. You don't have to have service when you're out in the field doing this. So if you don't have service, you can just put your phone in airplane mode and you validate that harvest. So it'll timestamp it. So then when you get back in service and take your phone off airplane mode, it actually just timestamps it. So if the wardens or anyone uh, look at your license and that you would just, they can actually look just to see what time you timestamped it at. So that's a kind of a newer technology that we're going to. And I think quite a few other states have something similar. Um, one thing I do want to touch base with on that is it is kind of confusing in our system. So we, we kind of have two systems going. We have an ALS number. So if you purchased a license in the past, it'll be your birthday followed by a number at the end. 
So my ALS number is my birthday followed by number nine. What that means is I was the ninth person ever to buy a Montana license with that specific birthday. That'll never change when I go on to buy licenses. I can use that. Um, when I got married, I just updated my name. So my ALS number didn't change. So you have your ALS number. That's what allows you to purchase license and uh, uh, buy and apply for permits. Then for the app, we have what's called a MyFWP. These two systems are kind of linked together, but the MyFWP actually lets you create a username and a password. Um, it allow you to log on the app, but even through the desktop website, it would allow you to um, check your drawing status, sign up for any of these surplus licenses. And I, I didn't do a slide on it, but we'll touch base here in a minute too. And I think Katie wanted to chime in on this on points. So we kind of have like what's called a bonus point system for species as well. All right, let's see what's next. Oh yeah, so these are some of our resources that we have. So um, the first one is just that kind of that website I showed you at the front. It's just where the hunting is. There's tons of stuff on there. If you're ever looking for anything, that's a really good place to start. Um, if you ever have questions on any of these too, you can also get in touch with me. We have what is called the hunt planner and it's just through our website. It's phenomenal. You can break it down by species. It can overlay the hunting districts. It'll show you, you know, roads where private land is versus public. I mean, it's a what it's just so much information on there. It's kind of overwhelming as well. Then we also have our regulations. We have um, we have hunting season dates. We have those cards with all that listed at our office. And then in addition to that too on the website, there is application worksheets too. So that kind of helps people plan ahead a little bit too. So the worksheet is broken down where it's like, oh, do you wanna put in for an elk permit? Remember that's a permission slip to go somewhere. Um, it asks you a bunch of questions when you do that, which I guess I didn't touch base on that, but maybe I could really quick. So um, we have the option, it's called party applications here in Montana. So if you're applying for a permit for a special area, or if you're putting in for a special license, you can apply as a party. Up to five people can be in a party. Um, basically what happens with a party is if there's five of us that put in as a party, we're given a party number. That's what goes into our drawing. If that party number is drawn, all five of us would receive those licenses. The party application process does not mean you have to hunt with each other. It also doesn't mean um, that if Katie and I went in as a deer party, it doesn't mean if I draw the license, she can shoot my deer. Because that's kind of a thing in some states with party applications. Um, so it's just a way to kind of ensure that uh, if, if you want to, you can put in with people and you're all going to be able to harvest the same animal, animals. So as an example, my dad and my two younger brothers and myself, we used to do party applications when we put in for elk permit. So we were going like four or five hours away. And maybe I was selfish, but I didn't want to be the only one that didn't draw a permit and get to hunt. So it was like, we put in for a party because we all wanted to hunt or we're going to go somewhere else. Um, you know, the party applications doesn't necessarily increase your chances because it's just the party number that's going into the drawing. So if there's five of us, that one party number is going into the drawing. If there's two of us, the one party number goes into the drawing. So it doesn't really increase your chances. Um, so we have that option when you're applying for licenses. Um, you have to select what districts you want. And then we also have a, a bonus point system. So bonus points, uh, you can buy those at the time of application. So if you're gonna apply for their species specific. So we have bonus points for antelope, antelope bee, moose, sheep, goat, deer bee, deer permit, elk, everything. So they're all species specific. So if you have five bonus points for elk, and 10 for deer, those are not getting mixed together. They stay separate from each other. And so um, our bonus point system, uh, uh, in theory, will help you uh, potentially draw a license or a permit. So bonus points are squared. So for example, if I go into a drawing with five bonus points, I'm putting in for bighorn sheep, and I have five bonus points, I'm actually going to go into that drawing 26 times. 
So the bonus points are squared. So they do five times five is 25 plus one for that current year's application. And that's something if you, uh, a lot of these are for trophy areas or, you know, especially for elk, but not necessarily because you can do bonus points for deer bee as well. The thing, the kind of nice thing about our system that's changed in the past few years too. So you do it at the time of application. If you don't apply for a certain species, you can buy a bonus point starting in July. So if you know, like in the future, I think I might want to hunt the moose, but I don't really have the time nor energy to research it, or it's just not in my cards right now. You know, I could start buying bonus points in July and those will add up. So over time, it's like, oh, I, I finally want to start putting in for moose. And wow, I already have seven bonus points accumulated over the years. Let's see, I'm not sure what the next slide. Oh yeah, so this is just um, Katie and I's contact information. And I just wanna iterate, if you have any questions for me, they now or later, if it comes up, even if you think it's the silliest question, call me, email me, get a hold of me, because I am happy to help. So right now um, we're super busy at the office and I help with the licensing call center. And so you think your question is silly, you wouldn't believe the questions I get on a daily basis. And it's just part of the job, but I want to make sure people understand and, you know, have all the knowledge they need on that. Do you have anything to add on all the hunting stuff, Katie? No, that was fantastic, Laura. I feel like you packed a lot into like a short period of time. So that was really great. Um, as Laura did say, you know, there... Um, it is complicated. So if you ever have any questions before you buy something, because some of those permits do, as she was saying, limit your opportunity now, um, or just your ability to hunt in certain places, you know, call, call people, call regional headquarters, because they're there to help. Uh, and Laura is just a fantastic resource. Um, I have two slides at the end that I just wanted to show because um, I, 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 you, in the past, I will wait until the night before the deadline and then buy those things. And this year, I didn't want to worry about that anymore. So this year, I, I put in for everything already because I wanted to put in for paddlefish, which today is the deadline. So if you want to put in for paddlefish uh, opportunity, today is do it tonight. Um, but let's see if I can get this to go for it. But I just wanted to show you kind of what this can look like. Um, so... Just so you know, if you are looking to hunt and fish in Montana and hunt and fish a variety of species, um, the sportsman's combination license is your most affordable option. Um, so your sportsman's license, it can come as a, when you go in to purchase your license online, it can you can choose sportsman's without bear. So it's right here on mine, or you can choose sportsman's with bear. Um, and so in the sportsman's combination license, when you purchase that package, you get your deer license, your elk license, your state lands fee, your upland bird license, your season fishing license, your conservation fee, and your base hunting license, and your aquatic invasive species license. So you get all of that. And you don't have to worry about checking those other boxes. You just choose that. Um, and then it automatically populates that moving forward when you're checking things off um, when you're purchasing it. So, so you get all of the stuff that you need. This is mine. So this, I just took a screenshot of what I've gotten this year. Um, I bought my sportsman's without bear. I don't hunt bear. My husband does. So he buys a sportsman with bear. I add on the migratory bird because I do want to go geese hunting. And then you add on the migratory bird harvest info. That's just a survey they take. Um, it doesn't cost anything. I add on the bow and arrow, which is $10, I believe. And that allows me to archery hunt. Um, and I think that's it. So I add on those, those extra things and then everything else falls under that sportsman's package. Um, and then as Laura was saying, I put in for a variety of permits um, and licenses. And I would highly encourage you if you're thinking about hunting moose, sheep and goat or elk, um, like antlered elk in Montana, start buying points now. Um, what we're finding or what I, I feel like I see is that you typically need like over 14 points to draw a moose, sheep and goat. Now you don't have to, the, it's just a lottery. Essentially you're, it's just the number of times your name goes in the big pot. 
So there are people, I've known people who have drawn moose tags with their first time putting in. So it, like Laura was saying, if you don't wanna, if you're not ready for that, you don't have to put in, but you can buy bonus points later in the summer. And that allows you just to accrue them. So I've been putting in for moose, sheep and goat. I've got eight and seven points. Um, same with elk, you know, in our, in the book, and then also online, there's um, draw odds in here. So it'll tell you for that particular unit that you're looking in, how many people put in for it and how many people actually drew and the percentage. And so there are a handful of highly coveted elk units that, um, you know, have like a 3% draw rate or a less than 1% draw rate. And so that's something to be aware of too, is like, you know, do you have actually have a chance? Is this a unit that you want to have a chance with? Like, and that kind of helps you kind of figure out, it'll say, it'll also say, I think it's on our website. It's an Excel spreadsheet. It'll show you how many people who drew it, not the person, but like how many people with three points drew this unit last year, how many people with eight points drew this unit last year. And it kind of gives you an idea of, you know, for some of these highly coveted licenses and permits, how many points you might need to have for it to be realistic that you might draw it. Um, and that can be really helpful. Just trying to figure out like, you know, do you wanna, like I put in for, um, I, I put in for two elk units that you need about 15 points to draw. And I know that I'm probably never gonna draw or not draw them for a really long time, um, but, I just put them in with the off chance that I might get them. So like the um, Sun River game range, most people who draw that have over 10 points. Um, but if I drew it, it's near my house and it'd be a great opportunity, but then I can put in for that, get my point um, if I don't draw it, and then I can hunt the rest of the state with my general license. So I would really encourage you to, um, you know, think about that, think about buying points because it's only, it's only a handful of dollars if you just buy the point and you don't even put in. So highly encourage it just to start building um, your base. I wish I would have put in, you know, for two years, I, I should have, I should have like 10 points now and I don't, and it just is like two points that I wish I had. <laughs> so, um, but that's, that's kind of all I had for this presentation uh, go ahead and stop this, but we'll just kind of open it up um, to questions about anything, about any hunting related stuff or fishing related stuff. Um, any, any questions that you might have, we're happy to chat. All right, someone got a little shy at the last second, but she has a couple of questions. Um, so we actually just went and finally signed her up as an apprentice hunter, and she is looking forward to doing turkey hunting in the spring. And then she wants, she has a few questions about the youth hunt for the deer opening. Um, did you want to ask me? You want me to ask for you? Um, what could I use like for the youth rifle? So her dad and I hunt with a 270 and she doesn't want to hunt with that. So she's worrying about the type of bullets and the type of rifle she would use. Well, I, I shot my first deer with a 25 out six. And it was kind of cool because uh, my dad got the gun. It was like <laughs> he worked for someone and they he used to make bronze bases and art frames. And the guy knew he didn't have a gun for the kids. So instead of paying him one day, he goes, oh, I don't have any money. I'm sorry, but there's something in the truck you might like instead. And he gave him that 25 out six. And me and my brothers all shot our first deer with it. Mm. that's really cool <laughs> yeah it's a nice little gun it doesn't kick but you got to remember too with different calibers or of guns too you can get different loads for them too so they don't kick and I think a big thing about it too is just practicing and being confident in with the gun that you do decide to use you know you want to ask your last one mm. So actually it was a with BMAs. So we hunt a lot of the BMAs around Billings here. And she wants to know if they're open for the youth hunt weekend as well. Um, so you would want to check on the back of their map. So I'm in region four, but most of ours are. Most of ours start during archery season. So if there's any restrictions, it would be on the back of their individual maps. Great. Which we got, right? Thanks, ladies. You're welcome.
and good luck. Yeah, if you haven't looked at our block management program at all, um, our block management program is when we pay private landowners to allow public access for hunting. And so um, you can find the maps online, like what Laura was saying with our hunt planner, the, there's a layer on there that you can bring up those block management units. Each unit is a person's private land. So they each have their own rules and restrictions of what they allow to hunt, uh, what time and different walk rules or drive-in rules. But there is a ton for central and Eastern Montana. There's a ton of land enrolled because a lot of the land that's just out available for hunting is, is private land. So I highly encourage to look into that program. Um, and then just to make sure that when you, you follow the rules, you sign in. And if you do harvest something, you drop off that tag um, that says you harvested something on their land because that allows our adjuster to pay them more money if there's a lot of people utilizing their land for, for hunting. So, and the, I believe, I believe the legislature increase the payment to landowners. So we we'll are continue to see an increase on mm -hmm. private landowners enrolling. I know we're nearing time on that note though. And I should know this. What's the, what's the easiest way to find out block management information? Like, I know you said hunt planner. Um, in, so in August, we actually get like books, just like we do for the, um, for the regulations. For me personally, I like the paper copies that I can have the book in my hand, but in the book, it's for the whole state and it has a map for each specific region. And then on the map, it has all these circles and squares. So like Katie was saying uh, that some of them are sign in boxes and then some of them are ones that require some type of reservation or written permission. But for each circle and square on that larger map, we have an individual map of that landowner's property. So it'll show their boundaries, roads, how to get there, where the sign in box locations on the back of the map, exact instructions, driving directions, how to get there, any rules they have. If it's one you need to make some type of reservation or go talk to someone, everything's laid out on the back there. Phone numbers provided, everything. Yeah. And not to like, I don't know, promote something that costs money, but um, I, I, they're on your Onyx as a layer and um, it's a, an incredible tool. And so on the map and on Onyx, it's gonna show you where the sign-in box is and the sign-in box will have paper copies of the rules that Laura's referring to. The actual paper copy has a map of the, of the area, the rules on the back. So like if we're going over to go antelope hunting over on the east side, there are so many different check-in boxes that instead of getting them ahead of time, not knowing where we might see herds, we'll just go there and then start, as we start scouting, start grabbing the maps as we pass by the sign-in boxes. Awesome. Well, that was a lot. I'm like, you both combined have just a wealth of information. So really appreciate you sharing your contact information and your personal stories. And um, I just wanna make sure, if, does anybody have any pressing questions before we wrap it? It can be on anything. We're we're pretty yeah. open about stuff. Laura, like I said, Laura is an expert on, like she, <laughs> I have a problem, I call her. <laughs> it's like, Laura, can you tell me exactly what this means? So um, it can be like on anything uh, hunting related. I'm going to drag her into the butchering workshop with me this year. Awesome. She's a great resource. Yeah, we That's butcher awesome. all our own animals too, so. Very cool. And if right. I just want to it reiterate too, if anyone has questions that come up, just get in touch with me. I'm happy to answer it, whether you're in our region or outside. And if I don't know the answer, I will help find it for you or point you in the right direction. Yeah. And keep an eye on those deadlines. They sneak up on you, especially the moose, sheep, and goat, May 1st. So get those points put in or put in for a unit. Most of the units are like one tag. So put in for it. Why not? Awesome. Well, thank you both again. And thank you, everybody who showed up. Really appreciate you being here. Stay tuned for more women specific events. 
Um, if you're not on Artemis Sports Women, that's one way to stay just looped in. Um, if you don't receive Montana Wildlife Federation uh, email alerts or just newsletters, that's another way. Um, and yeah, you can always get a hold of staff too. We're super responsive and can point you in the right direction. So thank you, Lauren, Katie, again. And yeah, thanks everybody for being here. Thanks, Morgan. Thanks. Thank you for your time. Thanks, guys.